Hello, this is our oral group presentation submission for NUR 2005 Pathophysiology and Acute Nursing Care. We are Cohort 1 Endocrine 2. Our topic is Addison's Disease by Harrison Ashby, Milio Tomsky, Priscilla Casaronis, and Alex Willis. Lola Hart is a 57-year-old Caucasian woman who was recently admitted to the Swinburne Hospital after being referred by her regular general practitioner and has been diagnosed with Addison's disease. In the week leading up to her visit, Lola experienced four episodes of vomiting after dinner and drinks with friends on two separate occasions and has been experiencing pain on the right side of her abdomen, which although had been intermittent over the last 12 months, has become increasingly painful in the last two weeks. Two days before visiting her GP, Lola then began to suffer from flu-like symptoms, which included a headache, dizziness, appetite loss, and joint pain. In addition to her acute symptoms, Lola has reported losing 15 kilograms over the last 12 months, and her GP has noticed signs of hyperpigmentation on her face and arms. Upon further investigation, the GP found that Lola was tachycardic with a heart rate of 115 beats per minute and was also demonstrating signs of postural hypertension with it being 105 over 70 when sitting and dropping to 96 over 60 when standing. All her other vital signs were within normal ranges. Her GP noted that in the back of his mind and with how Lola is presenting, she may be suffering from an adrenal insufficiency. With this idea in mind, he recommended, alongside his referral to the hospital, that Lola undertake an ACTH stimulation test and to draw bloods while she is there to help discover if there is an adrenal insufficiency and to rule out any other possible conditions. The results showed that her ACTH levels were elevated at 170 picomoles a litre and her blood showed that she was hyponatremic at 128 millimoles but her potassium was within normal range at 3.9 millimoles. Lola disclosed to her doctor that she is currently taking 5 milligrams of warfarin daily to reduce the risk of myocardial infarction as three years ago she had a mini stroke after walking a dog in the park. Lola also had a large melanoma lump removed from her lower left thigh two years ago after a previous doctor recommended it be removed. She was also diagnosed with autoimmune hyperthyroidism in 2007 and takes levothyroxine 200 micrograms a day. Lola is 170 centimetres tall and weighs 67 kilograms. She lives in her own home in Melbourne with her husband Greg and their two dogs Max and Buddy. She has three children whom all currently live out of home, however they all visit their parents' home at least once a week for Wednesday dinners. She sees her regular GP when required or otherwise every month. She hasn't smoked regularly ever in her life and has one set of drink a night, which is usually a glass of wine with dinner. Addison's disease is the most prevalent cause of primal adrenal insufficiency in the developed world. It is a rare and often misdiagnosed autoimmune disease that is characterized by inadequate production of the steroid hormones aldosterone and cortisol by the adrenal glands. Therefore, before we start looking at the pathophysiology of Addison's, it's important to have a clear understanding of the role our adrenal glands play in the function of our body. The adrenal glands are small triangular shaped glands found in the upper portion on each of the body's kidneys. They are essentially made up of two separate parts, the adrenal cortex and adrenal magella, both of which have their own independent function. The adrenal magella, which is located at the centre of the glands, secretes cytocholamines. You may know these cytocholamines better as hormones such as adrenaline, noradrenaline and dopamine. These hormones are responsible for the physiological characteristics for what we know as our fight or flight response, and they help our body to respond to stresses. The adrenal cortex is split into three different parts, the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata and the zona reticularis, and this secretes steroid hormones. It is regulated by what is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This hypothalamus then secretes a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone, and then this then stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete ACTH, which then further stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol and aldosterone. These two steroids are vital in maintaining normal function throughout the body with their respective receptors found throughout the body. They ensure things such as blood pressure, sugar levels, metabolism, and a reaction to stress, just to name a few, are maintained and controlled. If we look at Lola and how she's presenting in the hospital, we can now begin to understand why she's presenting with a variety of non-specific symptoms. This now brings us back to primary adrenal insufficiency, which in developed country is mainly caused by Addison's disease. If Addison's disease is defined as the inadequate production of both aldosterone and cortisol, we can see that a patient's adrenal glands, and more specifically their adrenal cortex, is not functioning as it normally should. With the definition of primal adrenal insufficiency being that it results from a disease intrinsic to the adrenal cortex, we can see how the correlation between these two works. In Addison's disease, the body's immune system mistakenly attacks healthy adrenal cortex tissue. However, the reason why this occurs is still largely unknown. 
The adrenal cortex has what is called a high functional reserve. This means that even a small part of healthy tissue from the adrenal gland can still produce the amount of cortisol and aldosterone that the body needs in order to maintain normal function. It is so high functioning that it's estimated that up to 90% of the adrenal cortex can be destroyed before symptoms even begin to show themselves. This highlights the importance of diagnosing Lola with Addison's disease as early as possible, so that treatment and care can be started early and the risk of experiencing Addisonian crisis can be reduced. To be able to begin diagnosing Lola with Addison's disease, we first have to know the symptoms of it. The symptoms of Addison's disease are usually dependent on which layers of the adrenal cortex are affected. An example of this is the zona glomerosa, the outer layer. If this is destroyed to a certain extent, aldosterone levels begin to fall. This presents itself clinically with symptoms such as hyponatremia, nausea, vomiting and dizziness that becomes especially evident when standing up. When we look at Lola's history and how she is presenting, we can see that she is demonstrating all these symptoms, so it can therefore be assumed that this part of the adrenal cortex has been severely impacted. When the zona fasciculata, the middle layer, starts being destroyed, disproportionately low cortisol levels occur. With cortisol hormones being the main hormone regulating the activity of the pituitary gland, this then starts to become overactive. When this happens, the pituitary gland makes more melanocyte-stimulating hormones. So what would the clinical symptoms of a patient be if their body was making more melanin? Hyperpigmentation, right? With Lola showing signs of darkening of her skin on her face and arms, we can see that the zona fasciculata within her adrenal cortex may have also been reasonably damaged and indicates to the healthcare team that the diagnosis of Addison's disease is very reasonable. If Addison's becomes severe enough, the zona reticularis, the innermost layer, can also be affected. This part of the adrenal cortex releases androgen, so therefore, if it becomes damaged, its ability to discrete this hormone becomes effective. This particularly affects women as it is their main source of androgen. With this decrease of androgen, symptoms such as hair loss, discreet sex drive can become evident in patients. Although this hasn't been seen or noted in Lola as of yet, these questions could be raised between her and her healthcare team in the future. Although all these symptoms can give us a... Overall, diagnosing Addison's disease can be hard as its symptoms are often non-specific and can correlate to a number of different symptoms. However, by a nurse and the healthcare team understanding the pathophysiology of Addison's disease and how it affects the adrenal gland, we can have the best chance of an early diagnosis and be able to provide the highest level of care to the patient. Nursing Management – Patient Education on Corticosteroid Treatment a key nursing intervention for the management of Lola Hart's presentation of Addison's disease is providing education on the medication used to treat and regain the loss of hormones. The nurse's role in patient education for Lola helps her to independently prevent and manage her medical condition, avoiding a possible episode of Addisonian crisis and increased mortality. Addison's disease is treated by hormone replacement therapy of those hormones, aldosterone and cortisol, that are not able to be produced by the adrenal glands. It is most likely that Lola will be prescribed corticosteroid medications, such as hydrocortisone, prednisolone, and dexamethasone. And upon her discharge from hospital, she will be taking those orally in tablet form two to three times a day. It is important for the nurses to explain to Lola the reasons for the prescribed corticosteroids. And following her diagnosis of Addison's disease, the nurse will emphasise how Lola will need to maintain her corticosteroid medication treatment for the rest of her life. The name, dosage and action of the prescribed medication will be taught to Lola. An explanation and expectation of the common side effects of such medications include weight gain, swelling around the face and eyes, insomnia, bruising, gastric distress, gastric bleeding and petechiae. These will be taught to Lola. The nurse will advise Lola to take her medication with meals to avoid gastric irritation and at the time of day they are prescribed, for example, in the morning with breakfast. The nurse will suggest to Lola that she weigh herself at the same time every day and if her weight changes by two or more kilograms, then inform a healthcare professional of hers, such as a GP. The nurse will emphasize to Lola the critical importance of taking her medication as indicated every day. Such non-compliance causes life-threatening complications, i.e. Addisonian crisis. If Lola is unable to take her medication for 24 hours or more, then she should inform her healthcare provider. The nurse should explain that during periods of persistent physical or emotional stress, these include illness and temperature extremes, 
Lola should be in contact with her healthcare provider to discuss a change in her medication dosage in order to combat such stresses. The nurse will inform Lola of preventative measures in order to avoid getting ill. These include being these include avoiding being in environments where the surrounding people are ill and environments where the temperature may drastically change from very hot to very cold or vice versa. The nurse will teach Lola to recognize signs of being undermedicated. These include weakness, fatigue and dizziness. The nurse will then emphasize the need to report such signs of underdosing to her healthcare provider. The nurse will teach Lola to avoid dizziness by moving and standing slowly. The nurse will also educate Lola to carry with her some a variety a variation of a medical alert necklace, bracelet, tag or card so that healthcare professionals are informed of her diagnosis, especially if she experiences an emergency episode in public. Nursing management, promoting home and community-based care. Many patients are able to return to work after their hospital admissions. However, others may still be suffering significantly from adrenal insufficiency. A referral for community nursing can be provided if extra support is necessary. A community nurse will be able to monitor Lola's recovery, management of hormone therapy and evaluate stress levels in the home environment. The nurse could encourage her husband Greg and her three children to participate in a family meeting to ensure they are educated verbally and with written instructions on the exact medication dosages, dietary requirements and how to manage Lola's symptoms when she is unwell. For example, to increase salt intake when she is experiencing stress or illness. The Hart family will be provided with corticosteroid single-use injections for emergency situations. The nurse will be able to provide education on how and when to use these. The family will also need to understand the signs and symptoms of excess or too little hormone replacement. This will include weight loss, postural hypertension, dizziness, and lightheadedness. These are all common signs of too little hormone replacement. Excess hormone replacement symptoms are edema or weight gain. It is important to make sure all family members are involved and aware of the risk factors and educated to best support their family member suffering from Addison's disease. Upon Lola's return home, after hospital admission, she may need some extra support services in place. Community social workers serve as a member of the interprofessional team to improve the well-being of individuals in the community. They can undertake assessments and provide necessary referrals for clients. In Lola's case, the social worker could provide counselling for her transition into managing her newly diagnosed Addison's disease. For many individuals, dealing with a chronic illness is one of the most difficult things they will go through, and this may be the case for Lola. Therefore, social workers are able to ease this difficult process. These things include hospital discharge plans, providing referrals for necessary services, and to support groups. Whilst caring for Lola, the nurse must manage and assess various aspects of her health. The nurse must be aware of fluid and electrolyte deficiency and abnormal vital signs that more commonly occur in those with Addison's disease. Therefore, an important nursing intervention would be to assess Lola's vital signs, as patients are placed at a higher risk of abnormal vital observations such as hypertension. Hypertension is common amongst patients with Addison's disease as it affects the body's ability to control blood pressure. If signs of low blood pressure are evident, the nurse could encourage Lola to increase her fluid intake to potentially raise her blood pressure. Management of adrenal insufficiency is managed through monitoring fluid, electrolyte and hormone levels. As in nursing management, the nurse could monitor Lola's fluid and electrolyte levels by assessing her fluid balance chart. This is an important nursing management the nurse must follow as Addison's disease is known to affect the balance of water, sodium and potassium in the body. The nurse may also test low <coughs> blood sugar levels to see whether they are in normal range for her. This is important to evaluate as hyperglycemia amongst patients in Addison's disease is common. This is because corticosteroid deficiency leads to an extreme sensitivity to insulin. If Lola is presenting with signs of hyperglycemia, the nurse should consider giving the patient food or drink that has a high sugar content. 
which can help raise blood sugar levels rapidly. Considering long-term management, the nurse should consider incorporating a dietitian to work alongside Molar. Involving an intercollaborate partner, such as a dietitian, can make the patient become more aware of the foods they should be eating in order to prevent complications such as low glucose levels, which is known to be common in Addison's disease. When a patient is hyperglycemic, it prevents the body from manufacturing carbohydrates, which are needed for cellular function as well as protein, for fighting infections properly and controlling inflammation. <coughs> With this in mind, a dietitian can help to create a meal plan that ensures the patient is consuming adequate nutrients to maintain glucose levels and help to prevent further hormone deficiencies. Potential complication. Medication non-compliance. Patient non-compliance with corticosteroid therapy to treat Addison's disease is a potential complication in Lola's management of her diagnosis. Hormone replacement therapy is an everyday regimen indicated to be taken at certain times in a day that mimic when one's body would naturally produce aldosterone and cortisol. It can hopefully be presumed that Lola will effectively apply the nursing education on corticosteroid therapy in her day-to-day -day life. However, because it will continue to span the rest of her lifetime, it is possible she may intentionally or not become non-compliant. Over time, Lola may doubt the effect effectiveness and daily needs of consuming her prescribed corticosteroids. Her perceptions of the treatment's adverse effects may deter her. If Lola begins to administer the medication to herself at an incorrect time to what is prescribed, then it may negatively impact her appetite and energy levels, leading to weight gain and fatigue. Depending on the specifics of the education provided to Lola about her treatment, she may perceive it as insufficient and not reassured on the positive effects of it. It is critical that the patient education provided by the nurse to Lola impacts the way in which she effectively complies with her hormone replacement therapy as prescribed for the rest of her life. Lola's needs to be assured and alleviated by her healthcare providers about any concerns she may have as this will impact her continual adherence. The adverse effects of non-compliance outweigh those of compliance. Potential complications, Addisonian crisis. It is important that Lola understands the potential risks associated with Addison's disease. Adrenal crisis is a sign of disease progression. It is usually triggered by an infection, exposure to cold, overexertion, or even decrease in salt intake. Patients with adrenal crisis typically present with symptoms of hypotension, clinical evidence of hypervolemia, fever, fatigue, depression, anorexia and a cardiovascular assessment which may show signs of an abnormal electrocardiogram. In addition, the patient may complain of abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. This can often be misinterpreted as gastrointestinal disease. However, if Lola was to experience any of these symptoms, it is very important to seek medical attention immediately to treat adrenal crisis. Some patients may try and self-medicate whilst experiencing adrenal crisis. Unfortunately, oral hydrocortisone tablets are insufficient to reverse adrenal crisis. Therefore, patient education is vital in ensuring Lola is aware of these risk factors and can act on them accordingly. The nurse will educate Lola on appropriate hydrocortisone dose adjustments for stressful medical procedures or from an infection to reduce the likelihood of developing adrenal crisis. Lola should also be provided with an emergency card and kit with a hydrocortisone injection that she can administer in emergency situations. If left too long, the damage from adrenal crisis can become irreversible. The treatment of adrenal crisis, if admitted to hospital, is intravenous hydrocortisone, a 100 milligram bolus followed by 200 milligrams over 24 hours as a continuous infusion in combination with an infusion of 0.9% saline. It is imperative that Lola understands the risk of developing adrenal crisis and does not feel ashamed to call for emergency help if she feels it is necessary.
It is important for Lola to be aware of potential cardiovascular manifestations that can occur alongside poor management of Addison's disease. Adrenal insufficiency leading to cardiac abnormalities can occur due to reduced plasma volume and electrolyte disturbances. As a result, cardiac arrest can likely arise either from metabolic derangements, such as hyperkalemia, or from severe hypervolemia, causing cardiovascular collapse. Other common cardiovascular complications of Addison's disease include hypotension, syncope, and arrhythmias. To prevent severe problems such as having a stroke or heart attack, it is important for Lola to ensure her fluid and electrolyte levels are maintained within normal range. As recorded by the general practitioner, Lola presented with a tachycardic heart rate of 115 feet per minute. Excess pressure being placed on the heart can cause greater and further cardiac complications. Lola also has a known history of having a mini stroke. Therefore, it is important for her to manage her adrenal insufficiency and be aware of signs and symptoms to receive assistance rapidly. Managing cardiac risk factors associated with adrenal insufficiency is imperative in preventing severe manifestations such as cardiac arrest and strokes from occurring.